With that, we're going to get into our program. We're going to keep it energizing and exciting. I'm excited to introduce uh, Amy Cortez. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, but our first panelists today will address key market drivers for investing in sustainability for private equity. Uh, Amy will be moderating this panel. She's the editorial director of Impact Alpha. And Amy has been a critical partner to the Center for Sustainable Business. You may have seen some of the articles that Tansi and her co-authors have published. Amy has been a critical part of that along with her team and bringing those concepts to life. So Amy, thank you for producing such great content and welcome to the stage. Thank you, Samir, and um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Um, and I want to make sure I can see the clock, and I can from here. Um, so um, yeah, we're, I'm Amy Cortese with Impact Alpha. We're very pleased to be um, a media partner for NYU, and I am thrilled to be moderating this panel. Um, we've got a full agenda today, so what we um, hope to do in this panel is kind of set the foundation for uh, the rest of the day's conversation. Um, and specifically, we're going to be um, exploring the market forces and drivers um, from consumer demand to regulatory issues uh, that make sustainability such a compelling business case and why um, for private equity firms that are viewing um, sustainability and other ESG topics as just a check the box issue. Um, they are missing out on some significant um, opportunities to uh, create value for their portfolio companies. Um, and I don't know how many people have been following the COP28 climate negotiations, but that has turned into a little bit of a shit show, shall we say. <laughs> Um, where there's a standoff between fossil fuel interests and um, basically the rest of the world. Um, so I just note that because what the private sector does really matters, and there's a lot of um, energy on the, on the private sector side. And so private equity uh, firms and their portfolio companies can be a, be a very, very uh, big part of that and have a big role to play. So with that, I'm going to do a very brief introduction of our, our panelists, and then we're going to jump right into the discussion. Um, so starting on my left here, we have Randy Kronthal-Sacco, who is a um, senior research scholar um, right here for um, the Center for Sustainable Business at Stern. Um, Aaron Smith, uh, a sustainable, sustainability strategy executive with Bank of America. And Corinne Kacharian, who is Managing Director and Co-Head of Private Equity with Closed Loop Partners. And last but not least, um, Cynthia Curtis down there on the end, Senior VP, Head of Portfolio ESG at Revantage, which is a Blackstone um, company. So Randy, uh, let's start with you. Tell us about your work at the Center for S Sustainable Business, and particularly, um, you lead research into consumer purchasing and, and run the um, Sustainable Market Share Index. So tell us about that. Okay, good morning, all. Uh, I'm Randy Crumple Sacco. Uh, so yes, I do um, what is called a sus the Sustainable Market Share Index, which measures uh, actual purchases by consumers of sustainable products in consumer packaged goods. Um, why consumer packaged goods? Number one, there's a third party that collects all the data from all purchases made at food stores or drug stores or mass merchandisers like Target and Walmart, dollar stores, convenience stores. And they graciously, this is IRI now Circana, Nielsen does something similar, graciously gave us the data of every single purchase made in those outlets. Um, consumer packaged goods, so there's a third party, but in addition, consumer packaged goods often is a bellwether for all industries, because consumer demand, because consumers are coming into the store fairly regularly, so you get really quick feedback as opposed to perhaps hard goods like um, a washing machine where you may see a move to energy efficiency, energy efficient washing machines, but those are purchased infrequently, whereas consumer packaged goods are, is a frequent purchase. So every year we report on actual purchases of sustainable products. These are products where the package 
shows a sustainable claim, alerting the consumer to the fact that this product is more sustainable than a conventional alternative. So what have we learned? Um, every year since 2013, uh, this share of sustainable products has increased. It's growing twice as fast as conventional products. Uh, it grew in the face of inflation, uh, which is important because sustainable products tend to be priced more, uh, priced at a higher premium than conventional products. Um, and COVID, when everyone may be seeding their interest in sustainability uh, because of safety, we found that not to be the case. Um, all categories are growing, and some categories have really skyrocketed, often because a PE-backed uh, product has entered the market and basically upended or transformed the market. Uh, and then usually those smaller PE-backed uh, products end up um, uh, being purchased by very large product, uh, very large companies, so very nice returns for everybody in PE. Um, Pricing, they do enjoy a 25% premium, so the profit margins of sustainable products are qu quite lovely. And I come from um, industry, so I was at J&J &J for 20 years, and we always are, as I'm sure all of you, looking at the profit margins. Um, innovation, so one out of every two new products over the last uh, five years, in 2021, sorry, one out of every two new products had a sustainable claim, so it is absolutely built into innovation. Um, consumers who buy sustainable products tend to be more loyal than consumers who buy conventional products. The future consumer, so the younger user, absolutely differentially buying sustainable products and over-indexing. And the last point that I will make is that an another study we just completed looked at environmental claims. And what we found is when products talk about environmental claims, they are not polarizing. So in a very polarized US, we found that environmental claims are appealing to the left and the right, to the young and the old, to the rich and the poor. And so that is really, and you will find all this data on our website, but that is a really compelling thing too because consumers want to hear about environmental claims. Um, yeah, that's, that's all fascinating and really um, remarkable resilience in the face of um, so many economic headwinds. Um, Randy, how often does that come out and when, when is your next, next one coming out? Yes, our next report is March at our practice forum. Okay, great. We'll be looking out for that. Um, and Erin, um, tell us about your, work, about your work at Bank of America and um, share, if you could, some observations on the roles of financial institutions in um, uh, you know, sustainability and how it's being taken up by private markets and, and perhaps maybe dive deeper into some of the regulatory issues that um, you're uh, grappling with as a, you know, a, a financial institution. Sure, thank you so much for having me here today and for your question. Um, so I'm the sustainability strategy executive for global commercial banking and business banking. And what that means is um, I cover middle market clients, so clients that earn revenues from 10 million up to 2 billion. And in my role, it's unique because I sit within the line of business. And our, our goal is to try to help support our clients as they look to look at their business models in a more sustainable way as we think about the transition to a low carbon economy. And I think the way I look at this transition, we all have a role to play. It's something about 275 trillion is what it will take to transition. No one entity will fund or finance that on their own. So there's different roles that we have to play. Um, I think that um, financial institutions, there's, there's a unique position that we sit in. Um, I think awareness, for example. Um, we cover 40,000 mid-size and large companies. And we also cover 2 million small businesses. That's a very unique position to sit in. And so awareness is something that, that we're looking at. We have had exploratory conversations with our clients across the middle market to understand where they were on their respective journey. And that was important to us because we needed to understand where our clients were so we could try to help them and support them in where they would like to be. So I think awareness is key. Uh, what we found is that our clients are at all different ends of the spectrum as far as their journey. Uh, but the number one questions we're getting is, what are my peers doing, right? What are some best practices? And how am I, how am I tracking? Am I leading, am I lagging? So they're looking for benchmarking, trends, best practices, and tangible examples of, of how companies in their respective industry are transitioning. And I think another role is sustainable finance. 
I think that we've been a leader in the space and that we've been carbon neutral since 2019. Uh, we have our commitment to net zero by 2050, and we have our commitment of 1.5 trillion in sustainable finance by 2030. I think this is interesting. That $1.5 trillion commitment is anchored on $1 trillion towards environmental. So things like carbon capture, clean energy, clean transportation, recycling, water, sustainable agriculture. Anything we finance, we look at it through the $1.5 trillion lens. And then there's the social side. Things like healthcare, education, non-for-profit, affordable housing, gender, racial equality. So I think that's the unique position that we sit in, to be able to work with our clients to help them transition and help them think about um, sustainable finance. I'll give a couple examples of that. I think that might help the audience. So affordable housing. Our community development banking group, we financed $7.85 billion of affordable housing in the year in 2022. But what does that mean from impact, that dollar amount? That's in one year, 13,000 units of quality, safe, affordable housing for low moderate income communities and families. But there were also social services, things like access, opportunity to help the economic mobility of, of residents that were living where we're investing. So childcare, job skills, access to nutrition. And in addition to that, of those 13,000 units, half of those are built to some sort of green standard. So that's an example of the intersectionality of people, planet, and prosperity. Erin, let's jump though to your, your working with um, your, uh, the companies that, that um, the bank invests in and your clients um, and working with them on their journeys. Um, how, where, how are you prodding them? Like what are the steps they can take? And then also, um, I, I do wanna get to the regulation because it's such a big issue. There are um, climate uh, emissions disclosure laws coming um, mm -hmm. and that's a big, thing for a lot of companies to get their arms around and it kind of ripples through the supply chain. So I'll, I think I'll, I'm definitely going to touch on this, I think, further on as far as best practices, as far as what we're seeing and how companies can think about it. So I'll, okay. I'll touch on it now, but I think it'll, it'll probably come up again a little bit later in the discussion. Um, but just understanding, um, again, where you are in your respective industry, think about your own footprint, how do you impact people and planet. I think data and transparency is really important. Measurement is extremely important. And I, I think you cannot move what you have not measured. So you have to understand where you are, again, to get to understand where you would like to be. And I think you have to start to build out your roadmap of thinking about here's what we would like to do. Do we have the team to support this? Do we have the capital to support this? Do we have the partners to support um, this effort and this work? And I think that you know thinking about your business in a more sustainable way is good for the long term. Because if we think about consumer sentiment, investor sentiment, it's shifting. And so I think that's where companies, it would behoove them to think about their business model more sustainably. Um, so I, I'll touch on the, the regulation. I'm going to focus on the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so it's $369 billion, uh, the largest commitment to climate change in the history of the United States. And it, it's meant to cover several things, but there's, I'll give five stated benefits. It's going to help reduce the cost of transitioning. In addition to that, it's going to help with energy security. It's also meant to help increase decarbonization investing across sectors, across industries. And then also there's uh, money earmarked for underserved communities, something close to 60 billion to help underserved communities as we think about a just transition, or some of you may have heard the term environmental justice. In addition to that, it's meant to help uh, resiliency and building in rural communities as well. What I would say, we're a year out, so I think we're signed August of 2022, so we passed a year. At that point, more than 270, 270 uh, energy projects were announced. And that was close to um, more than $130 billion in investing. All right, and that's huge. So if you think about that, it's also meant to help with job creation. So there's more than um, just healthcare and uh, energy, renew renewable energy and uh, electric vehicles across all those spaces from those projects that were announced almost are close to 86,000 jobs would be created. So I think the Inflation Reduction Act is something that we're looking to help our clients with understand and it's meant to be catalytic and help accelerate the pace of this transition and I think it's a really important policy that we have in play. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, thank you. I mean, so there are risk drivers like regulation, you're gonna have to um, uh, uh, account for and report your emissions, but also these fantastic opportunities that are driven by policy and um, are catalyzing um, 
uh, low carbon products and the transition. Corinne, um, let's go to you. Um, tell us about closed loop partners. You invest in the circular economy, but you also have an interesting business model where you work, I know, in different ways, depending on the part of the business with um, corporations. Um, so how, well, tell us about that and then how your corporate partners are looking for sustainability solutions um, and how you, you, know, you, you help make all that happen. Sure. Uh, so I'm Karine. I co-head our private equity group at Close Loop Partners. Close Loop Partners is really focused on transforming the linear model of take, make, and waste into a circular model of reuse and uh, recycling when you can't reuse it anymore. Uh, we have three businesses. Uh, we have what we call the Center for Circular Economy, which is really a research innovation arm. We have uh, an operating company. We also have a capital management group, which is where our funds sit. And the way we work with corporates is a bit different across these groups. But across the ecosystem, the closed loop ecosystem, we now have more than 50 of the large uh, Fortune 500 companies in our ecosystem. Uh, the way they work with us is as funders. They work with us as partners. Um, at the Center for Circular Economy, for example, I'll spend a few minutes on each business, but then I'll refocus on the PE side. At the Center, the way we work with them is they fund, they help us set the goals of what the Center will be focusing on. They also help pilot the solutions in their commercial operations. As an example, the center takes uh, several of these companies together on a pre-competitive basis to solve industry-wide problems. A Couple of examples are um, Starbucks and McDonald's coming together with a few other companies to try to uh, reinvent the cup. Another example is Walmart, Target, and other companies coming together to solve the problem of uh, plastic bag waste. Uh, so it's research, it's coming with them. Sometimes the initiatives are driven by the corporates across their pain points. Sometimes the initiatives are driven by the center and looking for the corporates that are interested in that topic. So that's one example, right? On the uh, circular economy side, uh, which is a material, uh, how to address material, um, the story is a bit different there. The corporates come in as investors but they also come in as potential customers for the recycled commodities that are a result of the operations. On the capital management side, the way we work with them, so for the PE side, for example, half of our capital comes from corporates. Uh, the way we work with them is technical and commercial validation of the solutions we're looking to invest in or the companies we invest in. They can come in as potential customers as well for the portfolio companies. And they also help us a lot around understanding uh, pain points, right, in terms of what thematics we want to focus on. I think you mentioned earlier awareness. I call it listen, <laughs> which is uh, two sides of the same story. And it goes both ways. It goes listen to the corporates and understand their pain points because that helps figure out which portfolio companies will succeed at the end of the day. But it's also listen to the portfolio companies and their pain points because that helps us inform the corporates around how they should change what they do to achieve their own objectives. So it goes both ways. Uh, I think the second part of your question was, um, you know, what are the pain points and how do we address them with portfolio companies? So it, it's different across companies, right? But one of them, one of the common themes for our corporates is they all made public commitments to sustainability and they all have uh, pain points and issues meeting their circularity objectives in their supply chains. So as a result, again, we try to understand those and address those. I'll take an example around packaging and going back to a little bit of what you were saying uh, around CPG companies. Commitments to recycling, uh, a lot of them made public commitments that 20% of their packaging would come from recycled sources. Uh, that is currently not available in the market, and it's hard to meet those objectives. So how do you meet those? That comes with a series of potential solutions around increasing recycling infrastructure, around increasing reuse, around new materials. So these are examples of the ways the portfolio companies can help address these issues. 
On some of the other types of companies, I'll take tech companies as an example, it's around supply chain transparency, it's, a it's around uh, supply chain resiliency, so again, it's different and the main message is to listen and try to address those pain points. I mean, in general, Corinne, are there a lot of unmet needs, like a lot of pain points that Oh, are, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. And I'll take an example of pain points that are increasing. Um, you know, we talk about sustainability not around circularity, but let's talk about decarbonization for a minute. And around, uh, I think you're more of an expert than I am around regulation, but California came up with the need to report on scope three emissions, right? Scope three emissions means your whole supply chain. And your whole supply chain means all these small, lower mid-market companies that we invest in and acquire could also mean the mid-market companies that a lot of the other PE firms invest in and acquire. So this trickles down really to, you know, pretty much the whole industry <laughs> at some point. Great. Um, well, thank you. And then let's get to um, Cynthia. Um, Cynthia, you um, worked at JLL, and now you're at Revantage. Um, so you've had a big focus on um, sustainable real estate over your career. And there's so much happening with sustainability and the built environment right now. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do and the opportunities you see for um, portfolio companies to embrace um, sustainability. Um, well, thank you. And what what rich experiences we have up here. I'm pretty excited myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm, I, I was eight years with JLL and uh, moved to Revantage uh, earlier this year um, because there is so much opportunity in the real estate um, sector. You can't get, we can't get to 1518, um, without going through real estate. Um, so uh, the, the, um, the reason that I moved to Revantage, which is a Blackstone um, shared services company, so what we do, it was founded really to provide um, back office support, you know, tax, legal, uh, HR, IT services to Blackstone's real estate portfolio companies. And um, Blackstone owns more real estate they're the largest real estate asset owner in the world. So, um, so when they approached me and said, you know, we've got, we've got a goal. Blackstone has a goal for a 15% reduction in the first three years of acquisition uh, within its um, portfolio. They said, well, we, we also need to be able to provide the support and the services and the guidance to our portfolio companies um, in order, if, if we're going to, actually expect them to reach that target. And we also don't want, you know, the, the idea is let's not have each of the real estate portfolio companies stand up their own functions across the board. Let's have a shared services model. So I was brought in to build and grow that on a global basis. Um, and, you know, but, but essentially the work that I was doing at JLL and the work that I'm doing here is all, it, it's very similar because it's all about accelerating, facilitating the decarbonization of the built sector. And there has never been um, any property anywhere that I've seen, whatever, and I would challenge anyone here, that does not have an opportunity for efficiencies, that does not have an opportunity for energy reduction um, and for carbon reduction. So um, a lot of what we do, and, and the other pieces, which is unique, um, uh, you know, not what JLL was primarily in the office space, but Blackstone uh, real estate portfolio is across the board. We've got low-income housing, senior living, um, uh, we've got um, retail, logistics, office, not a lot, um, biopharma, I mean, so it's really across the board. Uh, in terms of um, the, the scope of industries, which is really interesting um, and, it, and different from what I was used to. But again, efficiencies and, um, and just looking at retrofits and HVAC upgrades and all that, because primarily this is not new development. These are existing buildings, which are more challenging. Um, 
But, you know, to Aaron's point about the IRA, the regulation is really helping. IRA is opening up all kinds of opportunities for investment and looking at things in a, in a different way and just finding opportunities for um, low, uh, um, uh, low expense and high return type model. Blackstone is not um, what one would refer to as an impact investor. I think we could all agree with that. Um, but it absolutely looks for impact through its investing. And that impact is across a number of different factors, primarily profitability. So, um, you know, they're not, they're not, you know, this 15% reduction and this, this emphasis on um, decarbonization is not about um, being altruistic. It's all about the belief that this is creating value and when it's time for disposition of that asset, it's going to uh, command a higher um, return. And so, uh, you know, it's, um, there's nothing that, that is more, um, I think, uh, emblematic of the opportunity within PE firms for value creation and driving uh, profitability for investors than this story, frankly. Yeah, thank you. And let, let's touch on um, uh, regulations as well, right? Like here in New York, we have Local Law 97, I think which is part of a broader climate law, but we're you know, much more stringent um, energy efficiency and emissions um, rules are going to be phased in, I think, by the end of the decade. And then um, also um, insurance, right? Like, you know, things are getting harder to insure. Um, so these are all issues that you deal with. Can you talk a little bit about like the risk reward sort of um, uh, thinking there and, and, and how you approach that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and you know, kind of the risk mitigation is the other side of the same coin of value creation um, in my view. But, you know, the, the regulations in, you know, it's in spades in Europe already uh, and the UK, we're a global company. And, um, I would suspect that most, you know, when you look at supply chains, they're global. Um, so it happens in one area and it is a ripple effect uh, throughout the globe. Um, so I, I think, you know, insurance is one. I was listening recently to, um, as part of COP28, uh, I was listening to a podcast with Christiana um, Figueres and she was talking about the run up to Paris. So this is however many years ago. and at that time, she said, you know, the insurance, she was having in-depth conversations with um, leaders in the insurance industry, and they said, um, if we get to a two-degree world, there will be systemic uninsurability, which means not that, you know, you're, if you pay a higher premium, maybe you're okay, or you just have limited options. It means no options. It means no options. So we're closing in on two. I don't know what 2.5 or three degrees says, but I will tell you that one of the things, one of the functions that Revantage provides for our um, Blackstone real estate portfolio companies is insurance. And, um, and the questions are, so uh, can we keep our, uh, you know, our premiums down? It's like, no, we're gonna actually try to get you insurance uh, at, at the first. So. Um, but one of the factors uh, in that whole process is what are we doing around decarbonization? What are we doing around ESG? How do we, how do we help um, the insurers see the value that's being created through the work that we're doing to um, help the assets become more resilient? You know, so we're doing a lot of work around climate risk, physical climate risk on the entire portfolio. Where are there opportunities to, um, to shore up, no pun intended there, uh, to uh, shore up the, the um, resiliency of the assets, whether it be you know, uh, from ocean, but it's typically more floods that, that are from you know, riverine or you know, it's, it's more interior, which you don't necessarily think about. Everybody thinks about sea level rise, yes, but 
but there are floods from, uh, you know, major, we were just, we just went through it this past weekend, right? Just deluge of water um, that comes down uh, and may in impacts um, the, the, the viability of, of assets. So there's a, there is a direct and distinct connection between climate change and, um, and in the insurance industry. And part of, again, what, what we do is how do we help, you know, ensure that, um, that the assets are as resilient as possible, that the infrastructure upgrades are uh, as meaningful as possible, and then and we prioritize based on uh, a number of factors, but certainly included in that is um, the resiliency. Great, so climate resilience as a competitive edge. Um, okay, so let's, let's move into a new um, uh, question here. So um, I'd love to talk to each of you about um, some of the best practices and next steps. So um, what is your advice for leaders of private equity firms in terms of um, how they can best identify sustainability opportunities for their portfolio companies and uh, just build a more sustainable book of business. Um, and I, I guess we'll start here with um, Aaron. Randy. Randy, yes. sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, we have something at Stern which you probably will hear about later today called the Rosie Methodology Return on Sustainable Investment. And really what that talks about is all the pieces of sustainability and how that creates value. Uh, whether it's consumer demand, which hopefully I convinced you of in the earlier conversation, or risk mitigation, which we are talking about, or innovation through circularity and not dispose and, and using waste as another revenue stream, or um, having lending at a lower rate because you're more sustainable. All those together, uh, you know, whether, and, and I would encourage you to look at, the, oh, and employees, so we're, we're at a school. Uh, the, the employers who come here want the best and the brightest. The best and the brightest want to go to companies, regardless of industry, that do good. They, these young people don't want to go to pulp and paper companies, and I can tell you that for a fact because we know someone who runs a pulp and paper company. They want to go to companies that do good. And so for uh, employees, uh, and there's a lot of data that suggests that uh, if you are sustainable, you have higher productivity from your employees, higher uh, retention, and certainly attract uh, uh, talent. So regardless, across a number, a myriad of different measurements in our ROSI methodology, uh, you should be able to find and will be able to find a way to drive value. All right, so I would um, <laughs> underscore some of the things that I mentioned earlier in my first comments, but I think it's important that where you start is, who do you impact? What impact are you having on the planet? And I think starting there is a good first step. And I think that, to your point on consumer sentiment, your workforce, investor sentiment, who are your key stakeholders? Who are your partners? And I'd also touch on the supply chain. Who's impacting your business? Uh, where do you sit within the value chain, and what should you be thinking about in terms of a more sustainable future? Now, I think once you understand your impact and you can start to tweak and make changes, I think you start with the low-hanging fruit, and then you can build to more capital intensive, start to think about innovations and technology. I think a major part of this conversation continues to be and will continue to be data and transparency. Um, I like to say you guys have probably heard the term cash is king. I think data is king, because data tells a story. It can tell you where you've been, can help predict where you're going, and therefore can help you make decisions. So understand the data, be able to tell your story so you can share that with your key stakeholders, and therefore you give consumers the opportunity, you give investors the opportunity, your workforce the opportunity to make a choice based off the data and your transparency. Um, I think it's, it's very challenging, I think this is, come up a lot around the sustainability and energy transition. And I also like to think about the transition to a low carbon economy, but also a more socially conscious society. The expertise in this field, I think, is growing, but there's somewhat of an imbalance of expertise. And so 
finding that person that has the skill, the expertise, and or the passion. I think oftentimes the people that ended up in these roles did not go to school for sustainability, but they had the passion to, to be a change agent, to try to influence. And so I would say search for those people within your company and they'll work hard for you. Think if you can inspire people. This came up in a class that I was in recently. If you can inspire people, they will give you their best. So um, I think identifying those people is really important, understanding your impact, and then being able to tell your story. Okay, great. So I, I agree with a lot of what that, actually everything that got said, um, but I'll expand on it a little bit. One is around, you mentioned earlier, impact measurement and data. Totally agree with that. You cannot improve what you don't measure, so start by measuring it, continue by improving it, and then the third leg of that, use it as a sales tool, because if you're a portfolio company, that is your sales tool. That's your sales tool with your consumers that care about it, with your corporates that care about it. It's not just about reporting, it's about living it and about using it. Uh, that's number one. Number two, think of it on a systems-wide basis. We talk a lot about supply chains. Um, no company is in its, on its own. You need to think about the impact on several layers of supply chains ahead of you. You need to think about what disruption's coming your way. You need to think about where the world is moving 10 years from now and be ready for it. And sustainable, sustainable, the word sustainable is not just about impact, it's about resiliency, it's about uh, being there for the long run. You need to make a profit to be there. You need to be there for the long run and you need to be resilient, so all these matter. The third part of the equation, I think, is authenticity and transparency. It's very easy to tell a portfolio company, you go ahead and do that if you really don't care about it. Mission alignment is crucial. So I think sustainability starts with the core company um, and it's very important to be authentic. That goes to your comment about getting the right people. That goes to your comment about starting with the right message and having that message trickle down to your portfolio companies and their employees and everywhere. I think I'll stop there. I could continue. But. Um, so, yes, data, transparency, 100%. I mean, <laughs> I, th I thought I uh, had an appreciation for... Um, the importance of data when I was at JLL. It's a whole nother world at Blackstone. Um, and, it's, and it's really kind of incredible because of the, the, you know, when you really dig in and the different, you know, the, you can cut data in any number of ways, there's additional insights in there. So 100% um, on that. I would also say kind of, um, you know, expand the aperture a bit. So. For example, we're looking at, you know, particularly with the IRA, also, you know, some of the um, uh, incentives in various states allows us to look at solar far more um, aggressively, I would say, um, than I would have previously thought. So, you know, we've, we've got logistics. Well, we can slap solar panels on those roofs. You're not going to use all of that um, generated energy in that warehouse but you can create a community solar out of that and provide um, you know, renewable, clean electricity to low-income um, uh, residents. Um, likewise, in our kind of low-income senior living, you can also put, you know, take advantage of the incentives to provide solar, clean energy to low-income um, you know, uh, residents, um, senior residents, people that would not otherwise necessarily be able to afford it. There's just so many ways now that you can um, create the financial um, uh, uh, picture that says this is absolutely worth the investment. There's a return on it, and there's also a community benefit. So that's that's one thing. It's really just kind of widen that aperture to to um, take into account various opportunities that, that currently exist. But then the other is almost the, the flip side. You know, in the words of Yoda, do or do not, do. And if it's not, uh, you know, y you don't have all of the answers, you know, you still got to take that step. And I think one of, the, one of the things, you know, when people look at, well, it's 15% over, over three years, that's not, that's not a huge uh, reduction target. Yeah, true, it's not a huge reduction target, but 
if you are the largest asset owner, real estate asset owner in the world, that's impact, right? And that's impact at scale. And it's about, don't, don't be setting these 2050 targets. Set a target that is three years out, maybe five years out. What are you gonna do this year? What are you gonna do next year? What are you gonna do this quarter? What are you gonna do next quarter? You know, it's, it's almost kind of um, pulling in the, uh, the world of finance, what, you know, the world of Wall Street. What'd you do for me, you know, yesterday? What are you doing for me today? Um, with that focus of, uh, of uh, initiatives, and yes, some of the things, you know, some initiatives have a longer payback time frame. Some initiatives take longer to, to execute and to implement, but be very focused on the here and the now and the next quarter and the next year as opposed to the 2040s and 2050s because, you know, we're all not going to be in our roles at that point time um, and it's a lot easier to kind of kick the can down the road if you don't have that immediate goal in front of your face all the time. Yeah, very good point and getting out ahead of some of these um, inevitable trends that are upon us. And I would just add from a media perspective, when you do these things and you are perceived as a leader, um, whether you're embracing ownership for your um, portfolio companies or you're embracing sustainability, some of these ESG issues, it makes a good story for us in the media. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, okay, so we want to leave some time for Q&A. So I'm gonna um, ask um, a little bit of a lightning round maybe. Um, but um, let's, let's hear from everybody about um, Using your crystal ball, um, what do you think are the um, the biggest sustainability business opportunities over the next um, five to ten years? And why don't we start with Cynthia and then come back this way? Sure. Well, not surprisingly, anything that's infrastructure or infrastructure adjacent has tremendous opportunities. Um, AI is uh, it scares the hell out of me in a lot of ways, but. There are tremendous um, opportunities and benefits that AI can be uh, leveraged um, to leverage in the um, in the built sector and in infrastructure world. So, 100% double down on that. The whole EV transition, we're doing a lot of work in that area as well. Really looking hard at what makes sense uh, for investments to help facilitate um, and accelerate the uh, the EV transition. So. Tech, um, infrastructure, all in. I think 10 years from now, maybe it's hopeful thinking, but wishful thinking, but I think 10 years from now, there will be no difference between sustainability, sustainable investments, and investments flat out. Uh, all sectors are ripe for transformation right now, literally everything from healthcare to, you know, everything you mentioned and going on to consumer products and retail and literally all areas. The same way as 10 years ago, you know, people who want to do sustainability could only raise money from impact investors. Right now, you don't need to talk about impact. I mean, you do need to measure impact and report on impact, but anything you do, if it's not related to impact, is unlikely to be resilient. So I think 10 years from now is literally the entire sector. I agree with AI. You kind of stole it from me, but <laughs> um, AI has the power to make those productivity transformations that we're talking about and enable us to get there way faster. Um, so I agree with that as well. So my crystal ball is also very hopeful. Um, I think that advances in innovation and technology will continue to increase and hopefully scale. And I think when you couple that with economic incentives, um, it'll help to accelerate the transition. I also think, well, my history, I have about 16 years of real estate experience before I transitioned to sustainability. So the built environment is something that um, I'm very interested in. And it constitutes 40% of all um, GHG emissions. So I think that's a sector, that's an area where hopefully we'll see a lot of focus. And then the last piece I would point to would be the regulation. I think when you look at the transition, there's risk and there's opportunities, and I think regulation can help to drive that. 
And right now, it's specifically speaking about here in the US, um, because we're not as far along as um, overseas, I think there's a little bit of gray. And I would hope that in the future, it's more black and white, the expectations are set, and then companies can move forward more swiftly. So I would highlight technology innovation, regulation, and the built environment. Yeah, I'm not sure I can add much more, but it's interesting, Corinne, because I was going to say that uh, I think, I remember four or five years ago when I joined, everyone said Nirvana is when all business is sustainable business. I actually think we're here now. I don't think you can be in any business without touching on sustainability at some point. I actually don't love the word sustainability because it means we're statu quo, we sustain. We actually need to find a word that talks about moving us forward in a more aggressive way. There was just a study from Globescan which looks at consumers around the world. 40% of all uh, individuals, not just consumers meaning people, uh, who buy things um, have experienced an extreme weather event in this past year. That's huge, an extreme weather event, not just a weather event. Consumers get it. It's not going to be, so anytime you touch on something that people purchase in some way, whether you're uh, B2C, B2B, B2B meets C, B2C, all industries that touch on, pe with people, touch on people, I, hate, I don't even know what, <laughs> touch people, maybe that's the best, uh, rather than touch on people. Uh, touch people will be, uh, need to deal with sustainability. It's an existential threat to humanity. The planet will survive. The planet will be here in some form. Whether humanity is, is a question. So I, I too am optimistic, but I think it needs to accelerate in a big way. We need to, I'm hoping that today we're at the infancy of de a decarbonized e economy and that in 10 years from now, I'm saying the same thing, which is we are here now. Yeah, and I, I would agree with everyone. And I, I just think like, w you know, it's again, um, the hottest year on record. We've had, I, I forget, like six or seven of them in just the past decade. And it is touching everybody. So I feel like there's no longer, um, a way to hide from this, and no matter what the politicians do or the COP28 negotiators, people are feeling it at home. And a couple of you mentioned, um, you know, the generational um, demographics driving this, right? Like younger people want sustainability. They're they're um, uh, you know deeply concerned about climate change. Um, so it's it's going to be harder not to. Um, address these concerns. And the thing um, from, from my perch as a journalist that covers um, uh, the, the energy transition and climate tech innovation, there is so much innovation happening. Um, I'm really excited about some of the um, new um, uh, low carbon alternative materials that are popping up using seaweed or mushrooms or lab grown things um, that that don't have to um, destroy the, the natural environment and extract um, and, and have lower carbon emissions. So there's a lot of innovation um, and you know private equity, once again, is in a perfect position to be investing in some of these companies or helping their portfolio companies. They have now um, adopt some of these things that can dramatically lower um, carbon footprints. So um, with that, I'm, we're going to um, go to the audience for questions. And I think there's a mic that will be circulating. So if um, people want to raise their hand, um, and I can call on people. OK, we've got the woman in the red turtleneck. Oh, um, you mean at the moment or, yeah. Okay, so they're, um, they were supposed to wrap up this morning, 11 a.m. Dubai time, which is come and gone, um, you know, several hours ago. And basically the hold up, so the whole thing is, right, it was held in the United Arab Emirates, a petrostate, um, huge oil and gas presence. And on one hand, that's an opportunity to bring 
those people into the conversation because we're not gonna have a transition unless you get everybody on board. So there was some hope that maybe, you know, some, some good things could come out of this. And the UAE did actually, they're throwing a lot of oil money at <coughs> the energy transition, including like a $30 billion fund for the global south. Um, but I think what's come across more clearly is kind of the entrenched issues um, of the oil producing states and they are objecting to language that would um, uh, phase down fossil fuels, much less even phase out, which a hundred or so countries are in favor of doing. So that's really the big holdup right now. It's that language. Um, there are very entrenched positions. It's gonna be really hard to come to a consensus on that. They're going into overtime. Um, they have to finish up by Friday. So um, I don't know, we'll see, it'll be interesting, but just, it, it's kind of striking. There has never been fossil fuels, that term has never been in any of these, um, from the Paris Agreement on to these, um, you know, past several um, uh, COP28 agreements that come out of this process. So even if there's some um, mention of it, um, although they're couching it as countries could reduce their fossil fuel emissions and in an orderly fashion, which means, you know, it'll take forever. Um, but even just getting those words in there for the first time might be something of a win. But um, yeah, I, I think, you know, the fossil fuel interests um, are, are kind of the hold up here and they all want to keep pumping and keep the profits going, but the long-term trends are, that is a, you know, it's in long-term decline, right? And nobody wants to um, kind of admit that and take the next steps. That's my view. Others, watching? I'll just, I'll quickly cover on, not necessarily focus on the fossil fuels, but the partnership, the collaboration, and the movement that comes out of COP, when you're bringing interested stakeholders together to be in a room. I know, I'll give an example, because I think examples is something that we talked, we wanted to share. So as a result of an earlier COP, we had conversations and we were thinking about how can you impact, or how can we impact the global south? We don't have boots on ground necessarily, how do we assess the risk? And the best way for us to do that is through partnership. And that can come out of things like COP, or SMI, the Sustainable Markets Initiative. Um, led by our, our CEO, Brian Monaghan, and His Majesty, um, King Charles III. One of the things that we're focused on is SIDS, which is small island developing states, and they are disproportionately impacted by climate change. And so we are actively working with partners in those areas to help bring clean energy, infrastructure, job opportunity, to help the global cell transition because to Corinne's point, if we don't work together, if we don't collaborate, we won't get to the one and a half degrees Celsius. So I think that, yes, there are challenges as it relates to you know, what's happening in COP, but I also think that, I'm, and I'm hopeful that coming out of this, there will be lots of connectivity, lots of partnership, collaboration, and some acceleration on the transition, not just from a, a reducing carbon, but also from a social impact perspective on a global scale. Happy, happy to take that one. And that's a lot of what we focus on at Closed Loop, right? And part of it is recycling plastic. Part of it is uh, using less plastic <laughs> to start with. On the recycling front, a lot of the efforts in terms of how we work with corporates evolves around increasing recycling infrastructure, whether it's collection, whether it's processing. But it's also around what needs to change in the packaging to make that easier to do, right? So some of it is around, uh, without getting into too much detail, but the colors of the shampoo bottles we use. Do we need all these colors? 
uh, could we do something that makes the recycling easier? Some of it is around the shapes, some of it is around the labels. So a lot of this uh, is in the works. People are working on it, are trying to solve the issues. The other part of the question is around alternative materials. So can you use other materials? Part of the effort that needs to go into any solution is not just what are you using, but the recyclability of what you use. Because if you replace plastic with something else that you can't recycle, that's not very helpful either. So I don't know if that addresses your question, but it is front and center among the uh, areas and pain points that Closed Loop is working on. Yeah, and I'll add on that one as well. So I just completed a bottle water analysis, which I haven't even revealed to, to anyone in the center either. But when I looked at bottled water, because that's actually a lightning rod for plastics in 2018, and I'm just looking at plain water bottles, not all the value adds with, with uh, um, cannabis and, and, and seltzer, et cetera, and flavors. Uh, but when you look at just plain bottled water, when I looked at it in 2019, it was uh, about 20 fully recycled products. So 100% RPET, it was 20. 28% of the market, now it's 72% this last year. So really encouraging. The issue that I continue to hear from all the manufacturers we talk, to, talk about is just availability of RPET, so the fundamental infrastructure absolutely needs to change. Um, we are hearing from retailers, so the big retailers, Walmart, Target, are all partnering with big brands like Procter & Gamble to really change uh, either through um, Com reducing the amount of water being shipped, so compact packaging with less plastic, and they are trying to catalyze many different uh, industries within consumer packaged goods to do that um, and reduce the amount of plastic. And then finally, we just, in this consumer report that I was mentioning, consumers only want to, you to talk about the package if it's delivered in 100% recycled material. They have no interest in, talk, in hearing about recyclable material. They want it to come. So the consumer demand will change, but we have to make sure that the infrastructure can deliver. And this is obviously overly simplifying the question, right? Because there's different types of plastics, and some are easy to recycle, some are less easy to recycle, and we could spend a full hour talking about that. But And I, I just want to add that um, the it, it's in the business model of the oil and gas companies to expand their plastic production as they see the long-term trends of like EVs and, and decarbonization cutting into their um, oil and gas um, revenues. So it's kind of a race for the, the better, cheaper alternatives. Um, do we have time for one more? Or? No, okay, we don't. Um, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll be around if you wanna hit us up um, at the conference later, but um, <laughs> thank you everybody and a big hand for our panelists. Um, for doing such amazing things.